the church is born. So please join me in Matthew chapter number 16 and verse number 15 to verse number 18 and please read it with me. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And also I say to you that you are Peter and from this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Amen. The church is born. Jesus started by asking them two questions. First question is, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? And then he asks, who do you say that I, the son of man, am? The first question was what was called a loaded question. If you ever watch attorneys have been to court, they'll ask loaded questions to set up potential uh, response from you. Mr. Jones, you're an expert marksman, right? Yes, I am. <laughs> so your vision is pretty good. Yes, sir, my vision is 2020. That means that you can shoot from maybe 100 feet away. I shoot from 300 feet away. If you can see that well from 300 feet, why couldn't you see my client at 10 feet? You know, something like that. That's what happens. So Jesus says, what do they say? And then he says, now what do you say? Because your word should be different than the world's word. We have our greatest impact on the world when we are least like the world. We are not saying what the world is saying. We're not going where the world is going. We're not doing what the world is doing. If we're, do if we're doing that, then we are the world. God calls us out of the world. So we're no longer a part of the world. We're in this world still, but not of this world. We're ambassadors now. We're citizen citizens of the Most High God. Our citizenship is in heaven. We may be down here, but we're simply ambassadors passing through this pilgrim land. Who do you say that I, the Son of Man, am? And then Peter. Peter was a scholar. Peter was the one that, you know, when you were in school, the teacher would ask a question and nobody knew the answer to, so you just hope, don't call on me, don't call on me, don't call on me. And then there's always somebody who raised their hand. That was Peter. That was Peter. Peter always had the right things to say. And, and Peter would always say things you said, man, I wish I'd said that. You know, that's, that's, I wish I'd said that. I wish I'd thought of that. That's Peter. He says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, blessed are you. Because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. You could not have known this. No one could have told you who I am. You could only know this because you know my father. Hmm? Has anyone ever told you this? Now, before you marry her, meet the mama. <laughs> uh, before you marry him, go, you go check out the daddy. In fact, check out the whole family. <laughs> Especially that crazy uncle, those cousins or somebody, because they may want to come live with you. I need to come stay with you a couple of days, you know? Turns into a week, a month. Get to know the family. Because when you get to know the parent, they reintroduce you to the child. You learn who your mother was when you met and got to know your grandmother. You learn who your spouse is when you get to know their mother, your mother-in-law to be. You get to know and are reintroduced to when you get to know the father. You get to know really who Jesus is when you get to know the father. It's the only way that you'll know who Jesus is, is you have to know the Father. You can know about him, people can talk about him, but to know him, you really have to have a personal relationship with God the Father. So urgent, he says, but who do you say that I am? He says, now Peter, Peter, upon this rock, on this revelation of knowing who I am, I will build my church. 
The church is not built on knowing the pastor or knowing your denomination or knowing the history. Your church is built on knowing Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. When the whole church knows who Jesus is, you don't need to have people, you don't need to volunteer and trying to get people to do things. They do it out of a love relationship that they have with him. Love makes you do some strange things, doesn't it? Stuff that you never thought you'd do until you fell in love and you, how'd I end up at the quilt store? Who am I? Huh? I'm in here in the women's boutique holding the purse. How am I holding the purse? <laughs> and the other guys holding purses. You're like, you just, you ever know, there's no guys, if you go there, they have a special seat for us now. They have a seat there because I know the man, like a man chair. That way you hold the church, you try to be proud while you're holding the purse. <laughs> Love will make you do things that you never thought that you would do. When you fall in love with Jesus, it changes your DNA. Things you never thought you would say, you never thought you would do, he brings out the best in us. God changes you from the inside out. Don't ask God to change your world. God, have a revival and let it begin with me. Let, let the revival begin with us. That's what we should pray to God. Let, start here. Because if God begins to really change you, then everything around you begins to change from the vantage point where you are. You look at people differently. The same one that, that you thought one way about, now you think differently about them because of God's compassion. Thank you, God, for giving me back compassion. He said, what he says, upon this rock, upon this revelation of knowing who I am, I will build my church upon this rock. The strength of everything is the foundation. If you want to know how strong something is, always go to the foundation. That's where your strength really is, where you come from, your foundation, your roots. Your culture, that's where your strength really is. Get to know who you are. Be, be proud of where you come from. That's your strength. You are here because somebody came before you and they passed on to you their strength. So you are stronger as a result of who you are and where you come from. The foundation. No matter how big a storm is, you have Hurricane Katrina and great storms and hurricanes have come through. But you notice that no matter what they take away, they can't take away the foundation. You'll look and see what houses used to be, but where the house used to be, there's a foundation that reminds you that you can build again. You see, you can build again. Nothing can take away your foundation. And Peter knew where his foundation was. Your foundation is in your vertical relationship. The stronger that foundation is, the stronger your horizontal relationships will be. Your relationships are built on your vertical, not your horizontal. And no matter how much you love somebody, if you don't love Jesus, that relationship is going to, going to have some difficulty. Because the winds are going to come, the rain's going to come, the storms are going to come. And it's the foundation that's going to give you the strength to hold on. One more day, your foundation. You keep going back to your foundation. You know, you're frustrated, upset, but your foundation allows you to withstand and to hold strong. Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church. When you were between a rock in a hard place. Remember who made the rock. Remember who made the rock. Prudential gives you a piece of the rock, but with God we get the whole rock. <laughs> On Christ a solid rock we stand. All other ground is what? Sinking sand. Give God a ground of praise. He's our rock. He's our salvation. Don't we have to get excited by myself? Come on, join me. Make a note, storms don't uproot strong foundations. Strong, storms don't uproot strong foundations. Jesus says, I will build my church, not the church and not a church, you'll see his church, his church. And his church will be a church without walls, a church without bounds, a church without denomination, a race, a color, a creed, a church that has no founder except Jesus Christ, his church. When he comes, he's not going to call any real estate up. He's going to come, he's going to look for the church. The church is what he's looking for. The body. He's looking for that. And now as we define the church, there are a few ways to define anything. I'm going to tell you those four ways to define something. We usually define something by what it is, but there, there are more ways than define something by 
what it is. I'm going to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So if you're with me, you can go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. What chapter is that? 1 Corinthians 13 is called the what chapter? Love chapter. Yes, right. The Barry White love chapter. Y'all know who Barry White is? Y'all didn't always grow up in church? You weren't always in church? Listen to a little love theme. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm going to show you how God defines things and how we should define things, not just for what it is. When he looks at this, he talks about, in chapter 13, verse number 4, he talks about what love is. First of all, love is kind. Love is patient. Then he talks about what love does and what love does not do. It does not envy. It does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own good. It is not easily provoked. Now, what it does, it believes all things. It hopes all things. It endures all things. And then the culmination in verse 8, love never what? Love never fails. So when defining love or defining something, you want to know what it is, what it is not, what it does, and what it does not do. So when we're talking about the church, I want to, I want to talk about what the church is not first, what the church is not. There's a lot of controversy about churches closing nowadays. They say this church, churches close so many per week or per month. Some statistic on that. The first thing is a church is not a building. It's not a building. When we leave here in just a bit, we're going to lock the doors. But we won't lock the church. Because when we leave, the church leaves the building. You get that? So no matter what closes, unless your heart is closed, you are the church. We are the body. The church is not a building. You say, when are we going to get our own church? We got our own church. <laughs> you mean we're going to get a building? Oh, that's different. Because we, we got a church. You know, we got a church right here. A church who loves God. You know, and, and you go, to, I've gone to some dead churches. I don't know if you've ever been to a dead church. Somebody says, well, well, I want to preach in that church, but they wouldn't let me in. They won't let me preach there. And Jesus said, I can't get in there either. I can't get in. They won't let me in either. That's a dead church. A dead church. <laughs> the church is not a membership. Because some churches say we have X members. So many members, and that boasts somewhat about the church and gives them a sense of honor or presence or worth or value because of their members. The church is not membership. The church is not what goes on on Sunday. We may enjoy the experience on Sunday, and we can say we had church. We had a wonderful worship experience, but church in the end, here. The real church is what goes on out there. The 167 hours beyond this hour is when church really happens. Remember, this is the huddle. This is what we call the plays. So the day I call the play, and you go out and execute the play. That's how we advance the kingdom. Everybody here has a play, and if you play your part and execute your part, the kingdom moves forward. But if we decide that it's only going to be for this one hour, then we're just going to close the doors and we'll come back to church next week, you just miss church. You just miss church. Church goes on every day. You are the church. Some people will never come to the church, but they'll come to you. They may never read the Bible, but they're reading you. How are you reading to the world? Because the world gets to know through somebody who knows. That's what it's about. We're a referral, a referral business, right? <laughs> you get to know where to go because somebody goes there and they, they, they understand it and they appreciate it. Now they're sharing with you. We're beggars telling other beggars where they can find bread. That's all it is. The bread of life. We're not judges. We're witnesses. The world needs a witness. They need somebody that's not afraid not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, not afraid to be called by his name, right? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive your sins, and I will heal your land. 
That's a promise. And somebody needs to know that God is willing to heal their land if they would, would, would just humble themselves and pray and seek his face and turn from their wicked ways. That God is in the business of healing. But they'll never know unless somebody shares it. We can't keep Jesus the best kept secret that, that we have in our church. We've got to share him with the world. Shout it from the mountaintops that he is Lord of lords and king of kings. The church is not a good feeling. But sometimes we, we come and we, we enjoy. I appreciate this. I like the church. I like the music. I like the message. I like the pastor. You love me, don't you? You love me? <laughs> I like this. I like this. But that's not church. Jesus didn't die so that we could have a good feeling on Sunday. That's not why he died. So we come and think that because we don't feel things that we didn't have church, you just miss church. Church is a potluck. Everybody brings something to church. When everybody brings something, then we bask in the celebration and the glory and the praise that goes up. Amen. The praise band should not be the ones praising for you. Don't let nobody out praise you. Can you imagine somebody out praising you? Don't let rocks cry out in your place. Amen. You should not let anybody stop your praise. If you don't want to praise him, don't hinder me. That's a song. Where can we sing? If you don't want to praise him, don't hinder me. Oh, if you don't want to praise him, don't hinder me. Isn't that right? Brought me out of darkness into his marvelous light. If you don't want to praise him, don't hinder me. The church is not a checklist item. I went to church today. That's three times in a row, Jesus. Keep note of that. <laughs> And we can feel good about going to church. I go to church every Sunday. Yes. <laughs> you ever see people go to the gym every week but look the same? They look the same. That's what I go every. I go to the gym. I go to the gym four or five times a week. You know, but then nothing's changing. Nothing's changing. See, something should change in your life as a result of your relationship with Jesus. You should not be the same as you were last year, last week, last month, or even yesterday, something is gradually or always changing, and you're thanking God for the change that he's doing in us. Aren't you glad God is changing you and making you a better you? He says your latter days will be your best days. So you're looking forward to every day that God making you better and better and better. When I first left Louisiana and left home, I couldn't wait to leave those country backwoods people. <laughs> that was my mindset. But the more he lives in me, the more I go back and I look at it, I just want to sit down on the porch and just have my own watermelon and Kool-Aid and whatever they do down there and just, just enjoy being down home, being grounded again. There's no place like home. There's no place like home, isn't it? There's no place like home. But we rush to get away from home, but then we find out that home is a wonderful place. It's a wonderful place. The church is not a checklist. The church is, number one, the body of Christ, the body. The church is the body of Christ. That means each one of us are members of that body. Every part of your body serves the body. There's no part of your body that is not serving or doing its part. If there was something wrong with your body and it was not functioning, you would find out how to repair or bring back function to that part. So when we are part of the body of Christ, every part of that body should serve Christ. We're the body. Christ is the head. The head commands the body. Everything that happens with your body is commanded by the head. We are commanded by Jesus Christ. He is the head. He is our authority. So the church is the body of Christ. The church is a group of people called out for a special purpose. We're called for a special purpose. Every one of us has a special thing that you are meant to do that no one else can do. You're called because God has something that's specific for you to do. And ultimately, when we get to heaven and we hear him say, well done, thy good and faithful servant, we want to believe that we have done what he has sent us here to do. That should be our purpose and our quest. Lord, use me. Allow me to complete the work that you've called me to do. We're set aside for a special purpose. The church is the followers of Christ. We don't follow denominations. We don't follow pastors. We don't follow leaders. We don't follow what is popular, our theology. We are followers of Christ. 
we're following in the footsteps of Jesus. What would Jesus do? What would Jesus say? Where would Jesus go? We're the hands and feet of Jesus. The way the world gets to see him is through our good works. Our light shines to the world through the good works that we do. That brings glory not to you, but to your Father which is in heaven. Don't do your good deeds so that your right hand knows what your left hand is doing. Do it in secret, and the, and the Lord who sees in secret rewards you how? Openly. We are the hands and feet of Jesus. If there's anything good that's going to happen, it's going to happen because somebody knows Jesus. And somebody understands that if, it's, if you don't do it, it won't get done. It will not get done. Now, what does the church do? The first, the first point, the, the church is set to continue the work, to continue the work of Jesus. The church continues the work of Jesus. Husband and wife are coming home after church, and she says, honey, did you notice that the choir was off today? He says, no, I didn't notice that. Said, did you notice that the people were talking and chattering over there on the side? He said, no, I didn't see that. Did you notice the deacon sleeping up in the pulpit? He says, no. He, why do you go to church? Why do you go? You miss all the good stuff. But if it's all about Jesus, if that's all you can see, you don't even see me after a while. You start to see him. You start to feel his presence. That's why we come. You don't come to hear me. I know you don't come to hear me. I don't have anything to say, but I pray, God, use me. Give me a word that I can speak into the hearts of your people. Allow me to decrease that you may increase. Let me be quiet and be still that you may speak. That's why I start with, these, with, with what I've got here, and, and then the Holy Spirit says, okay, enough notes. I say, okay, and I just go with what the Spirit gives me. I lose my, as the Bible, as the Word, I give myself away. So you can use me. That's what we should always do, right? We don't have to be so politically correct, do we? Not all the time, right? Is it all right to just kind of let go and let God sometime? Well, you can't, you, you, you don't know what you said, but you know somehow God made it all work out for good. Hmm? God is the regulator. He fixes everything. No matter how you say it, no matter how you do it, somehow people will receive what God is trying to give you. You don't have to be that eloquent. In fact, the Apostle Paul says, I did not come to you with enticing words with an eloquence of man's speech, but I came to you in demonstration and in power. You want to be a doer, not a hearer. People would rather see the sermon rather than hear the sermon. You can give them a copy of the CD, but if you can just live it out for them, they can see what it really looks like. Love in action and faith in action and goodness in action and patience in action. That's your witness. We are models. We do what others do. And soon they want to go where you go because there's something about your walk and your witness that brings light. See, the world needs that light that we shine to them. They need it. And people will come and seek you out because of the light that is shining from you. Shining from you. John 14 and 12. This is Jesus' word to his disciples. Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. So we're meant to continue doing the work that Jesus did. John 20 and 21. Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. We are sent out. That means that we can't do it in here. Whatever that needs to be done, we are sent to do that work. Go into all the world. Don't go into the church. This is light shining among light in here. We got a lot of light in here. See, there's light on me. But the world needs the light out there. They need to witness out here out there. We can in here say, God bless you and hallelujah and thank you and I appreciate you, but they need that out there. They need to know that you appreciate them. They need to know that you care. They need your blessing out there. See, when you go out into darkness, that's when you need to turn the lights on. We can turn the lights on in the daytime when you drive for visibility or they can see you, but at nighttime, the light is really needed. Your light is so needed in the world. Don't turn your lights off in the world so that people identify you. We don't want people to know that you're a Christian. 
You see people that get to know you, you get to your workplace and you, you identify another Christian, you get up and say, you a Christian. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> In fact, the world should identify you. Amen. They should look at you and say, you're a child of God, aren't you? There's something about you that should, that should compel people to look at you and know that there's something about you that's different. And that's what they need. That's what they need. That's what they need. In Matthew 24, 14, this is Jesus speaking again. Uh, Jesus said, this gospel, this gospel shall be preached in the whole world as a witness to all nations. The whole world needs to hear this gospel. And then the end will come. So we're meant to go out into the whole world and proclaim it. Proclaim it to the whole world. The next thing is Jesus, as the church does, the church completes the mission. We complete the work that Jesus gave us. I talked last week about the Great Commission. Jesus told his disciples, go therefore and make disciples of all nations and teach them to observe all things. And baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Teach them to observe all things I've commanded you, and lo, I'll be with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, that's called the Great what? Commission. Great Commission. Right. See, now, that was a multiple... You get that of multiple trust question, right? You get that. But if you had to recite the Great Commission, could you do it? If you had to recite the Great Commission, would you do it? See, everybody should have a mission statement. That means why you exist. What do you do? What do you stand for? What makes you you? It's your mission statement. Your mission. Who you are. It's not what other people see. Who you are is what you do, what you don't do what you know and who you know. That defines who you are. The Bible says, enter into your, his gates with what? Grace. And into his courts with? Grace. With, that means you bringing it. Don't enter into his gates for Thanksgiving, for praise, finding something to be praiseworthy, find something to thank God for. You come in with Thanksgiving, right? Because God is good all the time. We've got so much that we can be thankful for that we should be able to come in here and before the praise band starts to play the first note, you're already up and giving God thanks and glory and praise. That's the relationship. That's the relationship. But if your relationship is with the church, then the church has to move you every week. I've got to move you every week. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4, verse 13. And we're to do this. We're to do the work of Jesus until there's a point. Ephesians 4.13, till all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Our work goes on. Till all become saved. There's somebody that God has placed on your heart and God's working on you with somebody. There's somebody that you know. God has placed there for you. That's your assignment. And they annoy you. <laughs> God, give me another assignment. No, God says, no, that one. But we're not there to be liked, are we? You see, when you set aside, they'll start to love the Jesus in you. If you let Jesus show up and you can step aside, it's the you that do not like things, but Jesus loves them. Jesus loves everything about them. And if you can love what Jesus loves, then you begin to see a different person. And the same way he begins to change you through that love relationship. Lord, teach me to love like you love. Teach me to love like Jesus loves. I want to be more like Jesus. I want to be more like Jesus. Last one is proclaim the good news. Acts chapter 11, verse 25 and 26. Acts chapter 11, 25 and 26. Then Barnabas departed for, Saul, for Tarsus to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So was there that there was for a whole year, they assembled with the church. They assembled with the church. Now, they didn't assemble in the church. They assembled with the church and taught a great many people. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. There are four basic blood types. A, B, AB, and O. And you're either positive or negative or the other factors that may distinguish your type. We all bleed the same, but not everybody has the same ability to cross. You can't donate blood to just anybody. You don't have, not everybody's a universal donor. 
Some can only donate to ones of the same type. Some are more universal than others. Some can receive more from anyone than others. It was thought at one point when blood transfusions first became common, people were concerned that they didn't want to change and mix blood of different races. Don't, don't make, make sure I don't give me any black blood. <laughs> Doctor, I wrote on the card. Did you see on the card? So make sure, make sure in the surgery, if I need a transfusion, make sure I don't give me the wrong kind of blood. And we look back and that just was so foolish. But can you imagine the reality of that? Mr. Jones, I got some good news, I got some bad news. <laughs> What's the good news, doctor? Good news, we got it all. Everything is good, the surgery went well. And in a few weeks, you're gonna be good as new. But doc, what's the bad news? Well, Mr. Jones, there was another Mr. Jones that was here and, and we, doing surgery and we, I don't know how it happened, there was a mix-up. There was a mix-up, we, we gave you the wrong blood. Come on, doc, dude, man. Oh, it's starting to happen already. Oh, Lord, help me. Oh, Lord. I told you not to give me the wrong blood. Is there a Popeye's near here? There is a blood that's universal. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Come on, let's give him praise. Let's go one more time. Let's... The blood. The blood. No matter what type you are, no matter where you come from, it's the blood that Jesus shed on Calvary. The blood that gives you and I strength from day to day will never lose its power. Look, listen to this. No matter how high you go, or no matter how high you get to be, it reaches to the highest mountain. And no matter how low you can go, it flows to the lowest valley. The blood that gives you and I strength from day today. That's what allows you and I to keep going. It's the blood of Jesus. You don't keep going because of anything that you have, anything about you. Our next breath is borrowed. It's not old. With our mindset, it's the blood. When the death angel passed over the land of Egypt, they said, put the blood on the doorposts because it's going to pass over the whole land. No longer separating Egyptian and Israelites, it's going to pass over the land. And what it's going to look for? Not Catholic, not Baptist, not Methodist, not saved, not Pentecostal. He's looking for the blood. The blood. It's the blood of Jesus that saves that's what the church is really about. It's about the blood. We've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Father, thank you. Thank you that as we leave, we have a charge, we have a mandate.